Uh, let's see, where am I? Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So I have a couple of action items. Actually, I guess I have all the action items. I'm trying to find time to work on those. Um, let's see, I guess who's on the call right now? We don't have Matthias, Matthias, Dennis, Fabio. Fabio, is there anything you want to mention relative to your SDK? Anything exciting or noteworthy you want to bring up? No, not at the moment. Okay. I'm just working in the version of HTTP binding binary, but just this, not nothing new. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Clemens, is there anything you wanted to mention from the C sharp side of things? Uh, no, I uh, um, I haven't done uh, I haven't done any substantial work on on anything really except some internal stuff. Okay. In that case, um, I can't remember exactly where this came up, but in some previous discussions, there was some question about whether the getter should say get event type versus type. And if I remember correctly, I believe the spec right now just says type for the property name. Um, but there are some people who I believe wanted to keep the word event in there. And I thought this might be worthy of discussion because I think it's important to have some level of consistency across the SDKs. Do you guys have any opinions on this? No. <laughs> no. Well, do you okay? Well, do you we, want we, consistency in the process? We, we changed we changed it from event type to type, correct? In the in the specification, yes. Yes. So so we should mirror oh. that same that same thing. We shouldn't be putting events into the SDK. It can't be yet. Of course, what's that? It, um, it can't, uh, if I would prefer event, actually, no, I do have an opinion. <laughs> if you want to make it all look the same, then get type is, is conflicts with, uh, with the CLI. Oh, interesting. Type and get type conflict with the CLR. Hmm. So I guess then the question is, do we want consistency across all SDKs or are we okay with C sharp being different for this one property? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm just saying, uh, I, I can, I can, I can probably work around the, the type type. It's just a little confusing because I can call a property type. So I work in the SDK. Um, of course, in C sharp, all properties are just properties, right? There's no getter and setter, um, or they're implied. So they look like they look like fields. And uh, I can name a field type without getting in the way of um, of the 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 type type. Um, so. Yeah, I guess I don't. I don't care as much. <laughs> Did you just I talk yourself out of it? It's myself aloud. <laughs> okay. Well, I, here's my opinion, which is, as much as possible, we should show that align uh, things across the SDKs where it makes sense. If there are language specific uh, or runtime specific issues that come up, obviously we have to work around that. Right, but I guess I'm still a little unclear. Clement, you started out saying that there was a problem with the Go, I mean, with the C Sharp SDK side of things, but then you kind of talked yourself out of it. So where did you land yeah. on that? Um, so, yeah, I'm okay. I think I'm okay with the type. Okay. Granted, we don't have a whole lot of people on the call, but it sounds like the general consensus is get rid of the word event in there, right? Yeah. And I know, Mark, you said that. Uh, Scott or Fabio, you guys have any opinions on this? Um, no, no. For me, it's okay to use get type or get even type. No. For me, it's okay. I mean, the, the, the issue will be is if we have to use a naked type, uh, in which case that type is typically a reserved word across a lot of languages, so. 
but as long as it's get type, it should be fun. Yeah. Okay, so tell you what, I'll send that a note uh, to, I actually don't have an SDK mailing list. That may be something we want to consider at some point, but I'll send that a note to the full mailing list and to the Slack channel asking for people's opinions, but that our preferred choice as of right now is to just remove the word event. We'll see what people's reactions are. Sound fair? Sounds good. And I like the idea of sending it to the entire list. There was a set, only yeah. a subset working on SDK that says impact across a larger swath of people. And I, I, I don't think that we have enough volume on, on uh, the mailing list that there should be a problem. Okay, yep, I agree, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, uh, so Scott, hold on a minute, let me see if I can unmute you. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not at a host, so I can't do that, so never mind, sorry Scott. You're on your own, try to fix that. Um, okay, SDK demo interop. Uh, okay, so. Interesting, so Scott, when you, when you come off mute at some point, I'd love to be able to find out <clears throat> more information about what you just said there about Knative not using the SDK. Um, oh my God. Does it work? Yeah, hey, there yeah. you go. Hey, so I took a look at the, well, the SDK as of like six weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I just wasn't comfortable pulling in Knative because it lacked most of the test infrastructure that would make me want to pull a project. And it didn't, um, it had a different view of how events were going to get treated compared to how Knative is seeing the world of event creation. Can you elaborate on the last piece? Because I agree that testing is an issue, but that shouldn't necessarily be a, a complete blocker as, as much as the oh, I absolutely point of time statement. Complete blocker on third party software. I'm not no, going to dependency that doesn't have testing. Well, no, I, well, I, I, I get that, but, but it's a point in time statement too. It's easily fixed. Um, I'm more concerned about a design decision, which is sounds like the second point. Uh, yeah. from. No, remember, my, my memory is a little fuzzy because I've been on leave for a couple of weeks. Uh, but there's currently three Go GoLang cloud event uh, libraries that are in the mix right now. And they all three took a slightly different approach. And we just had, we were preferring the, the current one that uses a little bit of type reflection and the callback that gives you the event page. Anyway, it's, it's like very deep details of that specific implementation. And we just didn't really want to play with this one. I, I understand having an embedded uh, SDK already and not wanting to rip it out or, you know, you have understanding of that. I would, it, it would be nice if you could file some issues with the current uh, SDK, I, I'm assuming Go SDK uh, yeah. to, say, you know, at least file an issue that says you need to, you need to provide more tests and another that says, you know, here, here are the, the gaps that I see with respect to what we're currently using. And at least that way we can, you know, is there a way to rationalize is, is the direction of the, the current SDK really that far off that it wouldn't be usable? I mean, it, it'd be good to get, just get feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can try. You know, we're also trying to move fast. And every time we take an external dependency, we, we have to do the dance of update dependencies and make sure that things are broken. Things like that. So Scott, how would you summarize your, your, your second concern there? Was it, there's a different design decision relative to how events are handed off downstream to functions? I can't remember exactly how you phrased it. Oh, it's, it's just a, how the, a plugin is architected, and it's not a wrong decision. It's just different than what we chose. Okay, can you so, give, just put a sentence in the, into the notes right sure. here, just to fill it out? Yeah. Okay, thank you. The thing that worries me the most is that if Knative goes in a different direction, are people going to assume that that's the quote unquote de facto standard, and are we doing the wrong thing with the, with the current SDK? I mean, really what we want is for people to be able to come to, to our repo and pull a, a, an SDK that's in use by 
some number of companies. It doesn't mean everyone has to, but it would be nice if we had some usage of it. So I, wor I worry about that. I think the only concern is that if they're not interoperable, then I think they should be. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of share Mark's concern there a little in the sense that if right out the door, the very first SDK we have for Go isn't used by a lot of the people who are within our working group itself, meaning the Knative folks, that would lead me to believe that that something isn't quite um, aligned or something like that. I can't think of the right word. Because um, as you said, Scott, even if it's not necessarily one is right and one is wrong, even if it's just different design choices, I'd like to understand why those design choices would were made by each party and to see if we can perhaps find some common ground because uh, I don't think the community is large enough right now um, around cloud events to necessarily justify two completely different implementations from this small same group. So it, yeah, if, you can, if you can just open up issues so we can have these discussions over there, I think that'd be useful. Okay. And, and I'm assuming that the the quote unquote SDK that you're using isn't really a separate repo, but likely embedded inside the venting. No, it's part of the uh, Knative package. There's a package repo. K so it's, okay. it's, in, it's in package? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Scott. I, I, and and just, just to belabor this point, I think it's important for us to think about what is it that we want around the venting and, and go if we think about the usages of this of this SDK, it really has to do with um, you know creating event uh, sources and then transiting those those uh, events. So if we're if we're talking about uh, K native, well obviously we want to make sure that we have something compatible and aligned with a project such as K native. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a Go person, but um, to pop out ones, uh, I think one of the goals of the serverless group is to just generally foster interoperability across platforms. And um, as such, I would certainly welcome if the core representation of a cloud event, um, not necessarily how you receive it and how you you know, bind into the transport and all those things, but how you actually represent the cloud event and how you how you handle it inside of the application looks exact exactly the same and is literally like compile compatible. So yeah, so so on the wire format should be compatible. No, 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 no. The OM of the cloud event itself. <coughs> and then and and then. Uh, model. Whether whether you, how you how you pull this off the wire, and how you kind of integrate that into your into your stack, and whether you um, you know maybe even how you send it in a different way, that might be different. But I think I think if we um, I would find it a little weird really if Knative as a host of apps. Um, would have a different OM than if you use that in, you know, any other um, um, uh, function framework. But I mean, that's a decision that you guys need to make, but I just find, would find that a little strange. Has anyone started working on uh, interoperability between these SDKs? That actually like, gets to the next point. Okay, great. Yeah, no, that was a great lead. My, my, my point is, whatever your reasons are, to diverge, you're making a decision to basically just go away from um, a common a common path. And I would welcome if um, there was convergence to a core library that satisfies the requirements that you have and satisfies the requirements that other and the other people have. Because ultimately, I don't think this is about you, but I think it's about the user. And the user should have in Go one way to re represent the cloud event in, in an OM and not 400. Yeah, I guess that goes to the question. So Scott, I wasn't clear. Uh, from an application point of view, right? If they write a piece of code and, they, and the function itself leverages the Golang SDK that I guess VMware has written, um, 
and then they also want to leverage the SDK as part of Knative, would their code of their application need to change? I'm guessing the answer might be yes, based on what you I said. I don't believe so, no. The, oh, no. The thing that comes on the other side, so the, the consumer of uh, the cloud events Golang SDK should consume events produced by Knative. Right, but if they take that, are the APIs either in or out of the application code different between the two SDKs? Uh, sorry, the what's? The APIs. <laughs> The APIs, um, like how you program to send and receive events. Yeah, yeah basically. Are, are and, and, yes. Okay. So, so an application written for the current Golang SDK would have to change in order to, to run inside like Knative. Oh, no, no, no. You can send however you want, right? Well, but if you want to leverage the SDK that comes with Knative, then it's going to be different, isn't it? Well, it, it, the SDK is different, but what gets produced and goes on the wire is not, right? So at the end of the day, something's getting a post from somebody else, and that body of that event gets transcoded back into a cloud event, and that is compatible. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was mixing things up. Okay. So as long as you're producing uh, the right headers and the body format, the thing should uh, smoosh back into whatever wacky... Uh, object model you have on either side. <coughs> gotcha. But if someone, if, so someone, someone pulls a cloud event off the wire, and now dispatches that inside of your app to uh, a background process, kind of in memory. Then they're always using the Knative API, right? So I mean, um, these are, these are they're, they're they're events, right? And they flow on the wire, but they also flow flow in memory. Um, because they're also very suitable for that, and they pop out somewhere on the other end. Um, oh, I see. I see what you're saying. So you want you want to have a, a another app or another SDK that comes in as a library in your application that consumes a particular kind of cloud event as an object. How, how, how close is your there's 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 application code that's hosted inside of Knative, right? And that can be of arbitrary size. How much of Knative needs to bleed into that? Application code. The Knative has none of that. We just yeah. define at the at the edges of the wire. Well, wow, you're yeah. making the SDK, and the SDK apparently has, now has an OM around. That's just uh, how we produce how how we produce the uh, cloud event. Yeah, the, this is where I got confused too, Clement. I, I I completely forgot that in Knative world, the application itself is in essence a monolith. It's a standalone application. Mm -hmm. That's and, that's right. And the anything that's running inside the Knative infrastructure is completely independent of the application. There's no connection between the two. When they want to talk to one another, they basically do it through, for example, a REST API. Yeah, they're they're hermetic. So in essence, you can have a Knative SDK for cloud events, and that will be used by the Knative infrastructure. Then the application can have its own cloud event SDK, which is used by the application, and those two worlds never touch, basically. Exactly. Hmm. So using Knative, you could actually make a compelling demo coming to your uh, SDK interop thing where you have an event produced by something, goes through a channel, and then you have uh, seven subscribers using a container with each of these languages using these SDKs, and can all of them consume the event the same way? Right, and so if, if there are seven if there are seven different applications with seven different SDKs being used, technically, we're actually testing not seven SDKs, but eight SDKs, because the Knative infrastructure uses its own SDK. Yeah. How well, many if, how many, if you how use many, our sources? So, so let, me, let, let me ask a provocative question. How many date types are in, in GoLang? Oh, man. Um, I don't know, eight, nine? Okay, then, then that world is apparently as chaotic as I thought it would be. Um, because- okay, uh, wait, wait, are, you, are you talking about Go itself or- yeah, how, many, how many date types does Go have? Oh, date. Uh, two. Okay. Does it need two cloud event types? No, no, because one's a duration and one's a time. See, so, so my point is, um, it could quite well, there could quite well be one cloud event type, which encapsulates all the data that we have, which is ultimately the core of the, the, the spec that we have, right? 
our core spec is doing nothing but defining an object model around, well, a set of properties and, and effectively the, the blueprint for an object model around a cloud event type. That's all it does. Yeah. And then there's adjacent specs, which are saying, this is how we go and bind these things to the, to the, uh, um, um, to the transports. And I can totally see that in you know, particular infrastructures, you will want to go and do the bindings in a different way than they are done in a SDK that is uh, built for, uh, with a bunch of, of generic assumptions that are not specific to an infrastructure. So I can see that. So I can see that the bindings being specific. But it would be great if there was exactly one cloud event type that everybody who's writing stuff in Golang uses. So just a little time check here because people are starting to join the call for the, for the regular serverless thing. Um, I, think it, I think, Scott, if you open up those issues we talked about in the Golang SDK, we should be able to at least have some of those discussions as part of those issues. I think that will help flush it out a little. Um, but to the other question that you started talking about, Scott, of demo or interop around the SDKs, that is uh, one thing I want to talk about, but I'm not sure how much time we have here. But I do want to at least start brainstorming around whether we want to try to do something, and if so, what would that look like? Is it some sort of formal, like, interop hackathon kind of a thing? Is it just a demo that shows these things being used, as you kind of described, Scott? I was hoping to do a little bit of brainstorming around this and see what you guys were thinking, if anything, yet. Uh, so, Keynated can also target external systems, and potentially this thing could, like, spiderweb out across the entire internet and every major cloud provider. Yeah. It's, it's, I guess it depends on what, what's the demo you want to show. But I think that the maybe the more compelling demo is, yeah, we've, we've shown that clouds can talk to each other, but I don't think we've shown languages can talk to each other. Yeah, and I'm not sure how do how do you show that, or is it in in your mind I, is just having a talk? I don't know that that's efficient? I don't know that that's exactly true because in the even in the demo that we had with um, at KubeCon that Austin did, we had we had all the functions written in different languages, JavaScript, Python, etc. It just wasn't using these SDKs at that time. That's true. And, and even the last one was, uh, you know, I, I used the C-sharp one. There was a bunch of, uh, I would be, I guess, the note one. So all the language coverage is, is largely there. I mean, it would be nice to say, here, here's a set of sample code that's using the SDKs that uh, we're using for this demo. That would, be, that would be interesting for people then to be able to uh, crib off of that and have a uh, start, starter guide for each of the SDKs. So I'm sure I understood you right there. You're basically suggesting is you, you could technically take some one of the demos we've done in the past and just have everybody use the existing SDKs and make sure that all languages are represented there. Right. And then provide the sample code, which is right. cool again. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of a demo itself, do you guys have anything in mind that you think would showcase things better than any of the demos we've done in the past, whether it's the Mad Libs or Austin's one before, or I think we had one in between there, or maybe there's just those two, I can't remember. Um, but do you guys want to look at a new demo or an, ex or, or an existing one? I don't know if you have time for it, but it'd be interesting to actually make a, a real world thing. Where it's some sort of factory that makes widgets that then gets them sold and stocked and shipped. Like what an actual business would do with cloud events. Scott, yeah, I like be, that. Yeah, I, I do too. We, Scott, would you be willing to, even if it's just a sentence or two, just add that to the to the agenda here um, in the notes section, just to, to get the idea going and then we can get other people to sort of build upon it? Yeah, that sounds great. Or, Excellent. Or, or, or even send, send a note out to the serverless working group email uh, and maybe we can have a discussion there. That works. Okay, well, I'll do that too. Yeah, excellent. Thank you guys very much. Okay, uh, we only have two minutes left before the regular call starts. Is there anything quickly you guys want to bring up? Because we're not going to talk again until uh, two weeks from today, except for through Slack. 
Okay. Good discussion. Yeah, thank you guys. This has been good. Okay, in that case, let's switch over to, where's my mouse? I need more coffee, so I'll, I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> okay. But I'll, I'll just hang on since it's the same call, right? Exactly, yeah. That's one of the reasons All we right. should use it. Okay. Uh, let's see who's on the call. Christian, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Uh, Klaus, are you there? Yes, I'm you. Okay. Fabio, are you still there? Yeah, you're still there. Yes, I'm still. Okay, excellent. David Baldwin. Yes, I do. Hello. Yeah, how about Dan Barker? I'm here. Okay. Uh, Richard? Hello, yes. I'm here. Okay. I'm assuming, Richard, you're on there twice, right? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> That's okay. Just want to make sure. Excellent. All right. So Scott, while we're waiting, since you took an extra long vacation, I'm curious, did you get to do anything fun or you just hang out at home? Uh, well, I split my time between you know, hanging out with my kid and uh, trying to build a bunk bed. A bunk bed? Ooh, how'd that go? I'm still working on it. I found out I'm allergic to walnut wood. <laughs> Did you break out in hives or something? No, I, it's just like, I thought I was getting a cold and then I didn't work for a couple of days and it got better and I would, would work again and I'd get worse. And like, what's going on? And I finally realized it was the dust. It irritates the back of my throat and kind of gives me a drippy nose. Oh, wow. So it's getting like this mild sore throat, and uh, yeah, it's, it was dumb. Huh. But uh, I got a respirator now, and so it's all good. That's interesting. It's snowshoeing a bunch. Yeah. All right, back to the agenda. Uh, Tam, are you there? Tam? Hello, hello, sorry, I was on mute. Yep, yes. No all right, what about Christoph? Hi, I'm here. Hello. And Chad? I'm here. Excellent. Jim, Curtis? Yep, yep. Excellent. Uh, Ginger? Uh, good morning, Doug. Good morning. And Eric, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good Excellent. Morning. morning. Uh, Rachel? I'm here. Excellent. Do, 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 do. Roberto is here. Roberto, excellent. Hello, this is John Mitchell. John Mitchell, thank you. Yep, gotcha, John. Let's see, anybody else? Do, 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 do. William, are you there? William? I'm noticing a different, oh, sorry about that, Rachel. No, definitely noticing a consistent pattern there with William. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Renato, are you there? Yeah. Excellent. Doug. Yes. It's Victor that? here from Itau. Could you Victor. put me there too? Yes, I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, hi, William. I got you. Okay, thank you. Yes, actually, I should mention um, if you guys join the call late or something like that, or you, or you missed the roll call, just go ahead and put a, a message into the Zoom uh, uh, chat and I'll. I'll take that as good enough. As long as obviously your name's associated with it, I'll, I'll take that as, as you're there. <clears throat> All right, one more minute and then we'll get started. Have a minute. Oh, Colin, are you there? Colin? Oh, excellent. Thank you. I got everybody. All right, it's three after one. Oh, there's one more person. Uh, someone new, I think. Lori, are you there? Lori Brickley? Okay, I, I, oh, I guess there's no audio. Okay, we'll catch up with them later. And Doug M is there too. Okay, let's go and get started. Three after. Uh, doo -doo -doo. AIs. Uh, I think the only one that's kind of jumping out at me is Rachel. You're, yeah, um, I have not made progress on it, but I will this week, I promise. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
All right, community time. Just a short time for people who don't normally join the call to bring up any topics uh, they may want to discuss with the group. Is there anything people would like to mention? This is typically for newcomers. All right, good, moving forward then. Okay, SDK subgroup. So um, in case you guys missed it or you got somebody wanted to join but they had the wrong Zoom link in the invite, I apologize for that. I included my personal Zoom by mistake rather than the the uh, serverless Zoom link. Hopefully a new invite was sent out with the right one this time. Um, I apologize for that. But there really isn't much to mention in terms of uh, progress. Um, the only thing that was brought up was uh, there may be a, a split in the community around the Golang SDK because King Native is not using the one we're producing. And so we're going to try to explore why and see if we can try to bring those two worlds back together. Um, if not, then no huge deal, but it'd be nice if we could bring them back together. Also, we're going to be looking at um, a new interop demo. Um, Scott uh, has already started some brainstorming ideas here, so I think he's going to send that a note as well. But please, when you guys get a chance, take a look at that, because I think uh, we may try to do something for Barcelona, um, not just another demo itself, but try to highlight the fact that we're using our SDKs as part of the demo. Um, so anyway, take, when we take a look at what Scott's written here, and I think you might send a note as well when you guys get a chance. And, get some brainstorming going around that. But other than that, um, oh, I guess I should mention, um, there was some discussion about uh, get event type versus get type as the getter for the type field. Um, I believe some people were advocating for keeping the word event in there, even though we dropped the word event from the spec itself. But on the call we just had, everybody seemed to prefer aligning with the spec itself, so, so dropping the word events. But I was going to send that note out to the mailing list to make sure everybody else is okay with that since we had uh, low attendance on the call. Um, so keep a lookout for that one. If you have an opinion on that, please uh, speak up. Otherwise, we're going to try to push people to go with just get type instead of get event type to align with the spec. Okay. Anybody from the SDK team or a, a subgroup have anything want to mention that I may have forgotten? All right, cool. Uh, let's see, Kathy, are you on the call? I don't see her, so I don't think there's anything to mention relative to the work group. I'm sorry, workflow subgroup. Nothing really happened there. <clears throat> okay, so moving forward to PRs. Let's see. I don't believe Alan is on the call, but basically he wanted to, instead of just say a 32-bit whole number, he wanted to be explicit about the actual ranges themselves. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this one? In particular, I want to pick on Clemens since you uh, were heavily involved in the creation of the data type section, whether you had an opinion on this one. Um, yeah, I'm in favor of this one. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Okay, any objection then to adopting it? Excellent, thank you guys. Uh, Tapini, I don't think Tapini's on the call. Uh, Clemens, this one might be another one for you as well. I believe that he just wanted to add integer to the list in this sentence. Go. Go as in yes? Go as in yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> does that make sure? Okay. Uh, anybody else on the call have any questions or comments about this one? Okay, any objection to uh, that minor change? What's with that oxert comma there? Where's that? Oh, this one? Does that bother you, Scott? I can get that change if that really bothers you. Actually, uh, the change that I would like to see on this one is to remove all of the or a, or a, or n, and just have a, just put commas between them and possibly alphabetize them. Okay, hold on a sec. Let's see. Commas, remove array. Okay. I'll work with him to make that happen. Anybody else have any questions or concerns? Okay. Hopefully that should be easy to go through. I'm assuming because those are all just syntactical type things. Um, if those syntax fixes go in, you guys are okay with just approving that offline. Um, no need to revisit it from a semantic perspective. Is that a fair statement? Plus one, plus one for me. Okay. Anybody else on the call have any objection to that? 
Okay. Um, oops, geez. I cannot type today. I apologize. Okay. Thank you guys. Uh, let's see. I believe this was an action item from last week's phone call. Let's hide the comments here. Basically, um, this first one is just escaping the, the star because everything else appears as italics. You can see right there. So it's kind of annoying me. So this is the real change down here in line 118 on. Uh, basically, just add something to the release process that says we need to send out a note uh, basically announcing the new release. Um, an obvious thing that we just forgot to do in the past. So send it to the mailing list as well as add it to the announcement section of our website, which is still under development as we speak. So it's just a minor change to our release process. Any questions or concerns about that? Don't we have a Twitter account? Oh, we do have a Twitter. Wait, do we? I think we do. Yes. Okay. I will do that as well. So hold on. Do, 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 thank you. Hold on. My if it's not on Twitter, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> that is one way to view it, yes. Oh, hold on. Um, okay. So I will add Twitter to the list of things here. Anything else you guys want to see changed? Okay. Um, I still consider that to be kind of a more of a syntactical thing. Are you guys okay with approving this one conditional to adding Twitter to the list? Works for me. Okay. Any objection to that? Okay. So hold on. Whoops. Okay. Thank you guys. All right. This one is a little bit more significant, but hopefully not too controversial. We briefly talked about this last week about how I think there may be some confusion about just having a property called content type because some people may confuse it with the content type HTTP header. So I was suggesting that we rename it to be data type instead, which is I think actually more accurate anyway because it is defining the type of our data property. Yes, well, it, we map it to the content type exactly in the HTTP binding because it is the content type. In the binary format, that is true, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, but, but that's what it describes. Right? Yeah, but um, I believe in the uh, not in the structured format, we actually have content type HTTP header as well as the CE content type HTTP header. No, we don't. We don't? Oh, I'm sorry. No, in the structure, you're right. We don't. And, and, and content type right. actually has um, uh, encoding. So there's, there's more. To co so content type is a fairly rich thing. It only says... Uh, you know, this is um, application JSON, but there's also um, potentially the character set. So you might have application JSON, semicolon, charset, ep charset, epsidic, um, et cetera. So all of those things are, are th there's a connotation for content type, and we're actually literally referring to the RFC, um, for which I don't have in my head right now. Um, oh, yeah. Well, why that's all defined, so you can't rename that because there's, 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 we, we should agree that we want to go and, and, and disassociate ourselves from that entire world of mime types and come up with something else. But while, if we don't, then we should stick to that because it's the content type. So, okay, let me, let me rephrase this because I, I maybe some misunderstanding here. I'm not suggesting that we deviate from using the mime type stuff or the, okay. the current semantics of content type. Um, it's just when I was looking at the, I can't remember for sure which spec it is. It's one of the ones that's up for discussion. It may be the open messaging one, or maybe it's the rocket one. Anyway, one of those two um, included the CE content type property inside of their message. And I believe they were confusing it with the HTTP content type header itself. And if I was... You, yeah, that should not exist. That should not exist. That, well, there's a rule in the HTTP binding that even in that case, right, the content type is being, so if, if content type is being projected onto the message, it is content type. There, CE dash content type cannot exist as that. Or. No, I understand that. But they were, they, were, they were including it within the body of the message itself because they were including a whole bunch of different properties in there. That, that is correct, though, because, because yeah. then it describes, it describes the, the text or the, whatever the basic foreign code content is. 
I agree from a, yes, I agree from a semantic point of view, but my point was I think they were actually using the wrong value in there and they were grabbing either, I think they were grabbing the HTTP content type header by mistake and putting it there as opposed to describing the data property itself. And what I wanted to do was to avoid any possible confusion by saying that when the content, when the cloud event content type property appears, regardless of where it appears, it would cause less ambiguity or confusion if we actually call it data type instead and let the HTTP binding still map it to the content type HTTP header. But it's, it's the content type of the data. It's not the type of the data. Content type. It, uh, I guess I'm not seeing much of a difference. My point, my point is content type is a thing itself. Con content, type, content type is not only the mind type. So this is the, so, so you have, you have a media type, which is what you see here, which is applications type JSON. There's a superset of that, which is the content type, which also includes a, a further description parameterization of that with, for instance, the char set. And, and what we're saying, what we're saying with here is, here's a binary thing, for instance, right, that's base 64 encoded. And to decode that successfully, we first need to understand that we have to go and turn that binary into a UTF, uh, using, uh, you know, uh, UTF-8 decoding into a string, and then we're going to run that through the JSON decoder. I'm confused as to why you think replacing the word content with data would necessarily change the semantics. Because it's, it's, so if you want to inject data in there, then that needs to be said data content type. Do, 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 do. What do people think about that? Even though it's a little bit more robust, I would actually prefer that to be a little bit more clear, but I'm still not convinced we need the word content, but I could live with data content type. What do other people think about this topic? <laughs> it looks like there is some room for confusion there. So if uh, set data content type makes it clear, I think that I'm in favor of that. I just ran into this problem uh, in Go where the, the Go serializer didn't understand and because things were trying to get mushed into application cloud event plus JSON, it got real confused. Uh, Scott, are you talking about the property name <clears throat> or about the value of the property? Uh, the property name. I think so. <laughs> my non cloud event SDK got a little, it, it uses this value, but as both what it sends on the wire and what it writes in the cloud event. Oh, I see. So you ran into the confusion point that I think I ran into with the other specs. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so do you think having a different name there, aside from content type, like for example, calling it data content type would have avoided that confusion? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so what do people think about data content type as the property name? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna pick on somebody here, though I know who had an opinion in the past about this, Jim. Yeah, pick on me while I'm eating. <laughs> um, I sensed it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, sorry, I, I was late in. Um, I, I think data content type is more appropriate if we're going to make the change. Absolutely. But, and we do need to separate, clearly segregate the transport data type from the data type of the data. I'm mean, becoming very redundant there. Um, I guess what would clarify this in an example would be, um, and people will hate it, but um, a binary, so a, a cloud events JSON transport with an XML payload in the data. So you've got a JSON document carrying XML data. So I guess in that case, your HTTP header would say it's JSON and the data Content type would be um, text slash XML or application XML. Yeah, so you'd like to basically take this example we have in the spec and fill it out more to show the HTTP headers. Yes, yes. Okay. But I mean, uh, but I mean, the, the thing is that obviously that HTTP header only appears in the HTTP transport spec. So, yeah. Okay, well, that's something we might be able to look at. I think Are you okay with that potentially being a follow-on to this. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, what do the people think? Any other people want to speak up relative to this one? In favor or against or just thoughts? Okay, what I think I'm hearing is general consensus to changing it to data content type. Um, what I'll do is I'll make that change uh, because this is a change of property name, which is a big deal. I don't want to rush this through. So what I'll do is I'll make that change and then give you guys a week to think about it. And then hopefully we can resolve that on next week's call, assuming no one else raises any objections. But I don't want to take the res resolution of this one offline. I want to let people have a chance to think about it. Does that sound fair? Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Clemens, thank you for the help on that one. Um, hold on. Change to data content type. And sorry for the being so nit nitpicky on these things. I usually don't care about names until they have semantic things. No, that's fine. No, I think we, I think we ended, ended up at a better spot. So thank you. All right. Uh, Christoph. Um, actually, Christoph, which one would you like to talk about first? Yeah, let's talk uh, in this order. In this order? Okay, cool. So this one we already discussed last week. Um, basically, what it says is batching is a good thing, um, but it's handled at transport labor. And then Tapani, I, I don't think he's on the call today, he requested that we should mention which is basically the last sentence that I edited now, um, that whether the particular transport layer supports batching is either to be found in the transport binding or in the transport specification itself. So as an example for Kafka, for Kafka, all we have to say in the binding is basically we map, this is a cloud event and this is how we map it to a Kafka message. And then how Kafka messages are batched is part of Kafka itself so we don't have to mention it in the transport binding so this is what the last sentence adds okay any questions on this one okay uh any objection to adopting it okay so let me just Cool. And then we can talk about the HTTP version of this. Exactly. So then during last week's discussion, um, we said it would be really nice to actually have batching for HTTP. And I agree. So maybe we can scroll down to the examples. So basically as a, a for HTTP, we basically have two modes defined already, the uh, binary and the structured one. And I think for the binary, it's pretty much impossible to do batching. Uh, because we map the uh, attributes to headers and that just won't work. So then that leaves the structured mode and the structured mode, um, well, can work with basically any content type. So kind of starting with JSON is easy. And then for the rest, I don't really have a solution. So what I basically did here, if you look at the example, uh, the body is now a JSON array and that JSON array con contains two JSON uh, uh, rendered cloud events. So pretty simple at that, I'd say. I think the, I, thing, the question is the, the MIME type, right? Exactly. So that's the next point I would get to. So if we scroll back up. Uh, which spec is that? That's the trend, HTTP transport binding. Huh. So um, I, I'm supportive of the format. Um, I think that's exactly the right way to do this. Um, I'm just wondering, so we have, because we have this, we have a, we have, um, so I would like to get a Seabor spec still in, right? Um, I just haven't done the, made the effort, but I think we should have a binary, we should have a nice, um, binary format, which is as JSON structure. Uh, and Seabor is um, is a good candidate for this, and we also obviously have Protobuf, um, uh, and uh, um, so I think there will be more encoding alternatives. Um, I would I would love for that batch to be defined in the JSON binding in the JSON binding spec, um, so that the because because really the 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 JSON the JSON encoding is so that that 
the basically payload the these these payload level batches are um, um, dependent on the uh, on the encoding. So you send an array of CBOR objects, or you send an array of JSON objects, or you send an array of of protobuf objects, and that sits in the binding. Because from a from a from a perspective of binding this all to all to um, uh, to HTTP, you've effectively done the work here of saying, I'm going to use this the structured mode, and now I'm going to send you a payload that 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 contains cloud events, and that payload is either a single cloud event, um, or it's a batch of cloud events in the following encoding. That's basically what you say with that with that with that content type. But it would be great if the the actual the actual format, which means the the array itself, would be in the in the uh, um, in the encoding spec, in the event format spec. I. That's kind of where I wanted to start, but then I realized we. Well, we we can discuss it. I think. Um, um, but the thing is that right now we say everybody should support JSON. And then if you make the batch JSON part of what JSON is, then what we effectively do is we force everyone also to accept batches. Yeah, but that is something that, yeah. But what, you now do, what you're now saying is batches are only supported in JSON. Not really. No, I mean, that's kind of why I opened up this pull request so we can discuss it I, in my comments on the PR, I also mentioned that this is a shortcoming of it right now. And if we find a good way to support batching for basically anything, then it's good. But I didn't. Um, one of the problems I had is that we, in our type system, we don't even have array. So it's pretty hard to go from there. But maybe it's a good idea to say every um, format can potentially support a batch. And yeah. if it does, so then you can use it from there. So maybe that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's a saner way to go because we because it would be great to I think we're not we haven't seen the end of encodings um, coming from XML. Um, uh, I now have the belief that even Jason is not not gonna not gonna be the 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 end thing for everybody. And uh, so having a bit flexibility in there, not bolting a particular format into um, into the transport specs is probably good. Okay, then I'll I'll do that for next week. I'll try to move the uh, sort of the batch itself as an uh, optional. Well, what what do we call it? Extra format into the JSON specification, and then make this whole thing. Yeah. The other thing that I want to talk about is the header. So if you um, scroll a little bit back up there in the beginning in section two or one or something um we talk about how the oh sorry a uh, little bit back down That's it. yeah this this section here sorry so um the receiver um basically based on the header the receiver can distinguish between which mode it is getting so I think that's why I think we need a new header value. You mean a new uh, uh, media type value? Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Okay, cool. Okay. And you're fine with the name? Okay. Uh, as long as it doesn't, it doesn't conflict with anything that is existing, you can choose whatever you like. You can call it Fred. Okay. This is a good name. <laughs> Fred. <laughs> Let's do that just for fun. So, Jim, I think you had your hand up. Uh, I did. Just a quick one for Christoph. I, if you wanted to put this in the transport binding, is there any reason why you didn't just go for a, you know, multi-part bodies in HTTP? Um, it's, that's potentially a good question. Um, I I think last week we talked about let's do a JSON array, so that's why I started with a JSON array. But I'm totally open to anything. I just wanted to start a discussion. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. No. My my multi part is a uh, pretty evil to program against. True. True. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, I think that's possible. And if, uh, it's, it's one of those things is like, if you don't find any code that someone has written already, you really don't want to. Yeah, I'm having flashbacks to a previous weekly call comments where you said multi-part is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no, I mean, it absolutely is. I, and, I, and I'm not disputing that. I guess it's the, um, it, it's really whether you want to leave this as a transport concern or push it up to an application tier. Yeah. Whether you make it an array or whether you make it uh, a one of in the, uh, the application level at the cloud event level. Yeah. I'm muddling my words, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's too early. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think, Christoph, you had some things you wanted to change or move things around, if anything, or if nothing else. Um, was there anything else you wanted to mention relative to just the overall concepts behind this? Um, no, I think we talked about everything then. Uh, there are maybe the one other thing is that I made this mode optional. I think I already touched on this because I don't think we want to, we say everyone should support binary and structured, but I'm not sure everyone should support batching. For example, in a function as a service, if you get a single HTTP request with a single event, that is pretty nice because it maps perfectly onto the semantics of a function as a service. Um, yeah. Okay. But, I just yeah, yeah. I just want to call this one must right here. I think that's a very good must and a, and a very important one for consistency and ease of processing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I think, yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Are people okay with this general direction? It's just now a matter of a syntactical moving around of stuff for the most part? Okay, I'm not hearing any concern, so that's good. Okay, so we'll get those chains in there. I assume Christoph uh, will review this again next week, right? Yep. Excellent, thank you. All right, cool. Uh, size limits, this one should be interesting. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think we started this one last week, but uh, let's see how far we, get. we can go. You wanna refresh people's memory on this one? Yeah, so I think the overall issue is that if we look at basically all messaging technology out of there, um, we know that they have limits in one way or the other. And, and I'm mostly coming from the producer side. Basically, what I want to know is what are the limits? If I send out a cloud event, is it guaranteed to reach its destination? Even if it starts, I don't know, on HTTP, then goes into a Kafka queue, then goes into... I don't know, over protobuf and then goes through HTTP binary to the final consumer. I want to know that whatever event I send, it, either I know it, go, it goes through all of these steps or it sort of fails somewhere. So that's what I want to know as a producer. I think if you write a consumer, you also want to know kind of what are the things you have to expect and support and what are things you maybe can write, push back and not accept. Um, yeah, so this is basically the main motivation behind this. And then I wrote down a couple of points that I think are worth discussing for today. If, I mean, if someone has general points, maybe we can touch on these. Just to, just to clear one thing though, you're suggesting that we need to do this section or this section, but not both. So it's one, exactly. it's, okay, just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jim, is your hand up? Wait, just a quick question or a quick thing. Jim, is your hand up from the previous PR or is this a new hand up? No, no, it was, it was on this subject. Okay. Uh, uh, and I think Christoph um, has done a really good job uh, tempering the conversation on the, um, on the thread. Um, as he mentioned, I think in one of his comments on that thread, I, I'm more leaning personally to the fact that we really want to say that an implementation must support messages up to a certain size, but may support stuff larger than that. So if you want to guarantee end to end, then you make sure your messages are below a certain size. Otherwise, you know, if you're in a, a closed environment, you know, with your own larger limits, you, you should still be able to have a compliant 
implementation rather than forcing people to always work within a set of constraints. Yeah. So it's more of a language change. Um, but that, that was one of my comments. Mask. Sorry, Christoph. Say again. Uh, was it, was uh, Clemens? Um, are you saying sh should because should because of mass? Should I I, it's more, it's more um, um, a provider requirement. Yeah. So we, what we should be saying, I think, is that if you provide a cloud event transport infrastructure, you must support messages up to a certain size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're basically talking about setting minimums rather than maximums. Yes, I think. I think. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 This is kind of what I what I do in the size guarantees section or option. Yeah, and I would tend to go down that more down that road because I think it's less limiting. Okay. So you got one vote for the second option. Okay, before uh, Christoph goes to his Hi, list of- this, people, this is John. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, my question is, are, is, is there anyone in the call that is dealing with whatever you want to call it, IoT kinds of use cases where the minimum limits we might reasonably talk about in other environments are going to get hosed or now be out of compliance? I think, John, that was why I was more leaning to a minimum, yeah? You, we'd, rather mandating that you as a producer always produce events of, a, of, of a, up to a maximum size. What we're really saying is, if you want to guarantee end-to-end, -end, then if you're below a particular size, it's guaranteed to work. Otherwise, you're... you're um, at the bequest or the behest of your particular service provider. Because people will vary, yeah? I suspect. Does that answer your concern, John? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not doing much really constrained embedded systems work these days. So that's why my question is more for people who are who are in those kind of markets, like, you know, what are, what are, what are realistic minimums, um, you know, that will still work for them and not, not put them into a, an awkward position. Right. Okay. Um, so Christoph, why don't we go through a list of things that you wanted to bring up for as discussion points? Yes. So the first discussion point was, Basically, should we have a limit or what I call a guarantee or a minimum guaranteed size? So I think we cleared that up. Um, the second thing I want to talk about are the attributes. So basically, uh, I, here I propose two limits. The first one is, I think, the more important one, which is it says like the whole event, including metadata and including the data itself, should not exceed 128 kilobytes. Well, then I, here I added another one, another limit on the top level attributes. So the reason I did this is that if you write a consumer or a middleware, the attributes are different. So the payload, the data itself, I can sort of ignore and just pass on. But for the attributes, I um, have to parse them. I have to load them in memory. I have to look at them and understand them if I want to do something like routing or whatever. Um, so potentially for a middleware, it would be bad if someone would send me 128 kilobytes of the top level attributes and then maybe like a byte of or no real data. Um, so I don't know if that is a concern to anyone. Um, if no one thinks we should have these additional limits on the attributes, then we can just kick them out. Um, but I would like to hear from if what, what the general opinion is on this one. So, Crystal, do we we don't make statements there about the size of an attribute content length, do we? I, I is, is saying it's a maximum of a hundred attributes. Does it add any value if we don't go on to say, and an attribute can't be bigger than a certain value in length? Yes, you are right on this one. 
I, I think I put this here as proposals and I hope that people who actually implement or have to implement things like these would speak up and say what actual limits they want or prefer. So, yeah, so if, especially if you look at the binary HTTP binding, then we already have in, in some uh, HTTP servers limits. So for example, they would limit the size of an individual header at a one kilobyte, for example. So we could think about introducing these limits as well. Yeah. But for me, the general point is more, should we have a limit on that? Is that useful to people? And if, if that is a yes, then we can go and, and look at what should the limit ex exactly be like. So I have a question on this because I don't have much experience in this space relative to, to size issues. And so I'm wondering, is it the overall size of the HTTP headers in, in combination or is it the sheer number of HTTP headers? I've, I've never, because I always kind of assumed that people were low on space, they were concerned with the overall size of the, the headers in aggregate. It, um, and it wasn't the, the exact numbers of headers that would have been an issue. But like I said, I don't have a whole lot of experience with here, so I'm curious what, what people's experiences are in this. The, the, the HTTP spec is silent about really what the sizes are, and I think the newer ones might have some, some suggestions, but it's all kind of all over the place. And so um, people have run into issues where they get a fat uh, JSON web token and try to stuff that into a header and then um, start finding out that there's a 4K limit or an 8K limit or, or some other limit uh, in the, in the, the respective um, uh, web server. So you that, said that, 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 are, does, that, has, that does happen. But are those, in that particular case, the 4K limit, is it on a per header basis or, or overall basis? Per header. Per header, okay, that's what I was wondering. And then there's then there's also um, and and most of those most of those uh, limits are governed by um, security concerns, where you just simply want to avoid that someone comes and and stuffs your server with um, with data uh, through the headers, uh, because headers are certain stuff that usually gets read and buffered before you touch the body. And the bodies where people then are concerned about, you know, loading up the memory, but there's usually some some memory buffer that you keep in memory uh, that you, that you keep around to to load in the the the, tra the header the header section effectively of a message, and you don't want to make that too big so that nobody can basically just DOS your server with uh, uh, with too much of uh, of a preamble. So there's a there are some real limits that are just caused by whatever config. Okay, thank you, Clemens. Anybody else have any questions or comments on that? Okay, uh, Christoph, was there another item on your list of things to discuss? Yes, um, the final one uh, was one that also um, Jem brought up. So there are, I guess it's not a new thing, limits on the side of messages and our, our patterns to work around with this, uh, particularly the uh, claim pattern. So basically what you do is you say, um, well, my payload didn't fit into this message and you can find this message at this URL. And then if you receive such a message and you sort of want to look at it, then you go back and fetch the message from there. So typically you would still send all the metadata with it it's just that the payload itself has to be fetched from somewhere else. So the question will be, like, it, it depends a little bit on what limit we choose, but is that so, uh, something of interest to people because they think they will run into this limit? So if that is the case, then we can um, start thinking if we wanna include that inside the spec, such a pattern. But I'm actually, um, not so sure if it's such a big thing because I haven't seen a lot of implementations around this, which makes me a bit wonder if it's a wide issue or if most people just send the messages of a few kilobytes and then they're just fine and don't need that. And then it kind of, well, blows up the spec a little and, and is an implementation overhead to a few people maybe. Yeah, I, and just to add to that, um, uh, I was only proposing adding that because if it was an issue that 
lots of people were going to face, then rather than ending up with lots of disparate implementations, at least we could sort of say, well, okay, if you're going to follow this pattern, then this is the sort of um, attribute name that we'd, or property name we'd like to use to store that reference. And that would sort of be the limit of where I think the spec would go in that in that context because there are security holes and lots of other problems with that pattern especially going across um, provider boundaries so um, it, it was more yeah just providing a mechanism and a pattern an implementation of a pattern yeah exactly so if you think about I'm storing this in I don't know AWS S3 bucket um, then maybe I have some concerns of who should access this bucket and so on so it's not clear if always a public URL is the right answer here. But it, like, even if we don't, if we kind of out of this discussion comes out, we don't want to do it with sort of planning to propose an extension because I think it will make sense at this level at least. But it's, I'm not sure if it should be sort of a required part of the spec. Yeah, maybe an extension is a good, a good way to capture that. I'm not sure. Well, so it sounds like at first the high order question for the group is, do we want to try to, to uh, I guess, standardize the claim check pattern in some way, whether it's a first class property or an extension, do we want to explore that, you know, that path at all? I, and I think the reason that I floated that originally was if we're going to say to people, you can't send messages over a certain size, then we should have some statement as to, well, this is what you can do if you do want to send messages over a certain size. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was really it. Yeah, because to me, it, it seems like even without the, the potential of something in the spec that does some sort of limitations, um, the idea of having a, a consistent way to do a claim check pattern might be something useful for us to consider. Even if we don't have the hard limits in the spec or anything like that. But then it, you're right, but then it <clears throat> it gets into the problem that I think one of you mentioned here, which one of you is how far do we have to go down that path, right? Is it as simple as provide a URL where to go get it? Do, then, do we need to then define the security mechanisms around accessing that URL or, or is that all out, you know, less as it, left as an exercise for the reader? How yeah, that's, down where you, that? that's where you get hand wavy, I think. Yeah, yeah. you have to, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, what do other people think? Is the claim check pattern something worthy of exploring? For larger messages, certainly. For, for larger events, certainly. Um, um, and and I think the gen so for for we give the guidance in, in for for event grid generally. Like if you have a large item that you need to go communicate about, always point to it and never include it. So. Okay, but that, that doesn't necessarily imply that we have to standardize it as part of our spec. We could say that's an application detail. So the question is, is, is there value in us specifying a consistent way to do it? Well, I don't think it does any harm. You know, if you say, if you're going to pass a reference, you know, by convention, we put the reference in this place. Yeah. I think that would be the limit of, of what we would do from a spec perspective yeah and just to be clear I'm, I'm asking just to play devil's advocate i actually do think it's a good idea to head on that path i just want to make sure someone doesn't think we're we're stepping the, we're overstepping the boundaries of a cloud event spec and getting into application level semantics or, or responsibilities so what other people think any comments concerns questions Okay, so uh, Christoph, I'm wondering whether it makes sense to split this PR into two. One is to pick one of the two choices and, and crisp it up if you need to, but then open up a second PR to deal with the claim check pattern. Because I do think they are individual problems that can be solved separately. Yeah, I think that sounds fair. And let's, let's do that, yeah. Okay, um, before we do that though, is there anybody on the call who disagrees with even exploring these two options or these two different PRs? I wanna make sure that the group in general is okay with attending these, these directions so we, don't, so we don't waste Christoph's time. 
I'm being quiet, but I think this is a great idea. Okay, thank you, Rachel. I'm going to assume that silence is generally okay with the direction of the conversation. Uh, so on my second point on the limitation on attributes, what, what is the general feeling here? I didn't get a clear answer. So we know that at HTTP binary, uh, for the HTTP binary transport, it will be a problem. But is that something we should then take on and make it a general problem or should we not have these limits here? Just because it's basically only a problem of the HTTP binary thing. Anybody have any opinion? I, I just think it, as I said, I mean, it just seems odd to limit the number of attributes without then also making statements about the size of those attributes. So I'm not quite sure if it's just adding more, um, uh, more language that people are going to struggle with. What, what, what does it mean and what to do with it? Uh, and I'm wondering if we should just take it out. Um, you could argue that an SDK could switch from binary to structured if it thought the payload, you know, if headers were going to be too big or whatever. Um, that would be another way to address that, I guess. Anybody else have any comments? Okay, so I, I'm kind of getting no one really wants these limits. So then I'll just take them out. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to interpret silence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm for I'm for giving some guidance. Certainly, I, I'm not. So the, I find the must provision a little bit a little bit harsh. Um, but in pra in all practicality, there will be limits, um, um, and people will have to deal with them. And making a statement that is kind of a should provision and and says, kind of here's here's kind of a corridor that makes sense. Um, isn't terrible, and I have I would have to say 128k is is w well within, within reason, and most uh, um, cloud messaging, like if you work with any cloud messaging or cloud eventing system, you will run into into some limit that is at at or below one megabyte. Trying to figure out, Christoph, do you feel like you have enough guidance from the group in terms of next steps on this? Yeah, um, I'm still unsure. Like, yeah, let me put it the other way: if we only have a limit of 128 kilobytes, is must be sort of accepted. Then it means that I can send 128 kilobytes of HTTP headers, basically. And that's will run basically every default configuration of an HTTP server will not accept that, um, which maybe is fine. And maybe the whole thing is that the other thing that I'm sort of is in my head, we could say, okay, the HTTP binary is more an optional thing. And if the HTTP server gives you back 413, this uh, payload is too large, uh, then you just switch back to the structured mode, which you have to support anyway. And then we're kind of also out of that problem. That would be another way to just solve it. Yeah. But apart from this particular issue, I think I have enough guidance to go forward with this. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I want to say something from a personal point of view, but I'll wait. <laughs> I need to formulate my thoughts here first. Okay, anybody else have any final comments on this one? I think we can sort of beat this one to death on this call. Okay, uh, Christoph, you know where you're going to go on with that. And that's the end of the agenda. Are there any other topics people would like to bring up? No? Okay, then last roll call thing. I have everybody except for Steve-O, are you there? I'm here. All right, and Laurie, are you able to get a microphone yet? Okay, Lori, if you're on the call, just put a message into the Slack chat or into the Zoom uh, chat and I'll get you in there. Um, oh, hi, Lori. Do, also, do me a favor then. Also include what company you're from because I think you might be near the group just so I can get your attendance in there properly. Um, 
Yes, and thank you, thank you, Christoph, for pushing the discussion on all these. I appreciate it. Hey, Doug, this is Varun. I joined five minutes late. I'm sorry, who's that? Varun. Varun. Oh, yes, I, I'm sorry. I did see your name there. I forgot to write it down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, right. obviously, I'm here as well. Yeah, I got, don't worry, Jim. I got you. If you spoke up, I definitely got you. <laughs> all right. Uh, last chance. Any other um, topics to bring up for the call today? All right. In that case, we are done. Thank you guys very much. We'll talk next week. Thank you all for a very good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye.